So in terms of the early conception of self-organizing systems, we had the self-organizing system and its environment, and that was rejected, and Ashby s said, every isolated determinate dynamic system obeying unchanging laws will develop organisms that are adapted to their environments. So his conception was that the organisms and the environments are together within one system and that the interaction rules are set during the period of observation. Now let me give you some examples of this. And this is in the material that I have just provided to you. Um, if you go to the end, uh, you'll see this page. And this is Ashby's concept of competitive exclusion in a number system. And what he's saying here is, assume you have a computer with um, a variety of memory locations. And in each memory location, you put a number between 0 and 9. And then your interaction rule is that you choose two numbers at random, multiply them together, put the first one back, and in place of the second one, you put the right-hand digit of the product. Okay, so that if you have 2 times 4, you put back 8. If you have 4 times 4, you put back 6, because that's the right-hand digit of 16. Okay, so, and then you just let that system run so that you're picking them, multiplying together, putting the first one back, and replacing the second one. If you let that run for a long period of time, what happens? Well, you can see uh, um, you have different times here. So the, the first time, second time, third time, fourth time. Uh, you just multiply those two things to like 1 times 7 is 7, 7 times 6 is 42, so you put down the 42, 6 times 4 is 24, put down the 4. See how that did, see, that, see how that worked? Okay, so the first time around, you have an equal number of evens and odds. The second time around, you have more evens. And as you see, the number of evens increases. Why does that happen? Well, if you have evens and odds, an even times an even gives an even, an even times an odd gives an even, and an odd times an odd gives an odd. So by a three to one chance, the evens drive out the odds. We're talking about competitive exclusion here. It's like competing species. But even beyond that, the zeros have the highest chance of surviving. Because any number times a zero is a zero, and five times an even number gives you a zero. So over time, the evens drive out the odds, and then the zeros drive out their fellow evens. Now you can do a partition, and this is using Shannon's information theory. And that's what I've shown you on this slide here. Um, Shannon came up with a measure of variety or uncertainty. And he defined information as a reduction of uncertainty. And if you have a number of categories, say like numbers, if these are the numbers uh, between 0 and 9, and you have one number, you have 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4, et cetera, then you have the maximum uncertainty. If you have all zeros, there's no uncertainty. If you pick a number at random, you know what it is. It's a zero. Okay. Well, then you can compare uh, the variety that you actually observe with the total variety possible. That is, and the variety possible, that is H max, is when every item is a different category. Compare those two and you get a measure of redundancy, which is at the bottom there. Redundancy is H actual over H max. Okay, so if everything, basically if everything's in the same category, it's completely organized. 
If everything is in a different category, it's completely unorganized. So in the case of competitive exclusion, you go from zero organization to complete organization. All right? Just go up the trajectory. Well, that seems kind of silly, <laughs> kind of a dumb example. Uh, here's a little more interesting example on the next page. It's the history of the telegraph industry in the United States. Uh, and it goes on for two pages, actually. So you have the first page, and then you have the second page. Okay? Now, let me explain to you this diagram. Time is on the left, and it starts out at about 1845. And in 1845, it looks like there were three telegraph companies. The, each line is a history of that company. So it was founded here, and at a particular point in time, it merged with another company, so the lines join. So that every straight line is the history of the company, from when it was founded to when it merged with another company. So in the beginning of 1845, you only had three companies. Somewhere in the middle, say around 1860, you had a large number of companies. And the branches with the largest number of leaves going into them were the companies that did a lot of merging. And at the end, at the bottom of the chart, what, about the 1880s, 1890s, you'll see there's only one company, Western Union. Why did that happen? Or, put it differently, why did Western Union uh, survive? Assume that's the United States. <laughs> it's not a very good depiction. In the early, in, in the 1840s, you had a lot of East Coast activity. What happened in 1860? Civil War. So the, those companies that were going north to south had a disruption in service. But those companies that were connecting up the Western Union, the Union side, toward the West, got a lot of business because they were channeling troops and food and guns and material back and forth to the Union to fight the South. And then what happened after the Civil War? Westward expansion to California. Telegraph had to go along with the railroad. So the company that for whatever reason was connecting the Midwest to the East Coast had a great boost both from the Civil War and from the subsequent westward expansion. And so Western Union <laughs> won. Now, if you place a ruler across this diagram and count up the number of companies and look at how many companies had come together to form a company, you end up with the partition that you see here. So that the first time, there are four companies. The second time, in 1850, you have 23 companies, but there are no mergers. By 1855, six companies had formed one company, three companies had formed a second company, two companies had formed a third company, two companies had formed a fourth company, and then there were a large number of other independent companies. By 1875, 95 companies had formed one company, five had formed a second company, three had formed a third company, and there were a large number of independent companies. And by 1900, 146 companies had come together to form Western Union. Then you can plot that on a graph, and once again, you go from zero up to 100%. Now, you can think of that as uh, a sort of natural monopoly. 
Uh, you can certainly think of it as competitive exclusion in the case of Ashby's competitive exclusion in a number system. Uh, you can also say that there's a natural tendency toward monopoly uh, if you have if you don't have major technological change and you don't have federal regulation, so you have economies of scale uh, and you have a positive feedback that causes one company to dominate other companies in the absence of federal intervention. Okay, so that business leaders will often say, if you just get the government off our back, you know, we'll be able to do very well. And in many cases, that's true. If, you, if the government uh, imposes uh, licensing fees, that's an automatic source of corruption. Uh, and it, this happens in countries around the world uh, that the government puts in lots of barriers and then in order to get over the barrier, you have to make a payment to somebody. So if you can get rid of that kind of government interference, then yes, uh, you get a more efficient, more responsive, market system, but you also need to, to hold down the monopolies. So you need, to, you need to break up the monopolies in order to get a competitive system. And that's what we did with the oil companies, Standard Oil Company. They broke up Ma Bell. Uh, they thought about breaking up Microsoft. Uh, and going back to the, our earlier discussion, um, it's, there's an advantage in having one American company that dominates in the information field because then you have a back door to all the information systems around the world. And if you want to be able to monitor what other people are doing because you want to control terrorists or whoever, you might want to have that. So maybe it's not a good idea to create a completely competitive system uh, in, the, in the information field. Well, pure speculation. Um, but in any case, you can control the rate of monopoly. And I would maintain that the natural course of events, and you can see this in nature, is to get one species in one niche. The way you differentiate yourself is you define a new niche that nobody else is, is in, and then you have a monopoly within that niche. Okay, so if you want competition within a niche, you have to hold down the big guys and boost up the little guys with small business loans. You hold down the big guys with antitrust activity. So that one of the roles of government is to maintain a certain level of competition within the different uh, niches. But if you have rapid technological change, then you're constantly redefining your niches. But those are all examples of self-organization uh, within an economy. All right, now I have some other examples for you. Um, in your thing, uh, well, okay, let, let's just, because I kind of skipped over. These are examples of causal influence diagrams, the, the first ones. So your task in the first ones is to put a sign on each arrow and then to label the loops. Uh, so if you want to do that uh, over the lunch break, feel free to do so, and I'll check your work. We can go over it in class, see if everybody agrees. Uh, then you'll see, so these are arrow and loop problems. Then you see word problems. And in this case, you not only have to label the loops, you have to define the loops. So you need to identify the variables. You can go through and underline things that look like variables, then arrange them uh, in, in a diagram like this, and then label the arrows and the loops. So here you have to identify the variables, and we can go through that too. There are two examples, the oil crisis and the tragedy of the Sahel. The tragedy of the Sahel is complicated, but so go for the basic underlying structure. Those are causal influence diagrams. Yes? Uh, do 
learning requires self-organization.